Welcome to the Your Town Television program. My name is Jeff Klein, your host for this MPS Foundation sponsored segment where we uh, provide you an uh, insight into both interesting faculty and students and research activities that we're doing in your local area at the Naval Postgraduate School. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Paul Berry. He's a member of the Systems Engineering Department uh, and a faculty member. He is uh, uh, also a graduate of MPS, and so we'd like to learn a little bit about more him and the research that he's doing. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Now, uh, you came to NPS in 2009 as a recent graduate from Rutgers, is that right? Yes, it is. So uh, what did you get a degree in at Rutgers? So my degree was in statistics at Rutgers. Yeah. Okay, so how did you co come about coming from Rutgers to the Naval Postgraduate School? Yeah, so um, it's a hike all the way across the country. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, How did we recruit you? How's that? Yeah, so uh, so I grew up in a military family. Oh, uh, did you? What yeah, service? I did. So my father's retired army. Oh, okay. And, well, we uh, won't know. All right. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little rough, and uh, and it. Uh, I'm about the only one in the family that didn't uh, that didn't get the message. So my my younger brother is active duty army. Oh, great. Uh, my other brother is active duty army, and my sister is active duty army. Really? What so, do they do, real quick? Uh, so the, my brothers are infantry officers. Yes. And uh, my sister's a signal corps officer. Have you and talked to so, them coming into MPS yet? I, I've tried to sell them. I mean, one's at uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. The other's at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Fort Benning. I said, yeah, you can come out to Monterey, and uh, it's, it's beautiful out here. You won't end up uh, some of the places that have Army bases. Well, that's and, right. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, keep that so, pressure on them, absolutely. I'm, I'm trying it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, so I'd always grown up in and around the military, and... Uh, after, uh, throughout college, I worked at an Army base in New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, where Rutgers is, doing failure analysis on, on radars, uh, so something that was a statistics-focused statistics, statistics -focused thing, but I was trying to figure out, well, I don't want to do statistics my whole life, and uh, and uh, base was closing, and so at the recommendation, actually, of my father, I called out to here, because I was looking for different graduate programs, found one of our faculty members out here who told me they were starting up a doctoral program at the same time that he was starting up a, a research program into statistics and, and, and looking at using it for early stage ship design. And Great. so I said, yeah, if you want to come out here, work for me, um, you can work on your PhD at the same time, and I said, that sounds sounds pretty nice. Now, so, who was this? Which faculty uh, member? This is Gene Paulo. Okay, well, yeah. we'll have to have Gene on the show sometime with his Certainly. students. Yeah. That's absolutely right. So uh, you, you got your doctorate here, but what did you do your dissertation in? So my, my dissertation was on something called Capabilities Focused Model-Based Systems Engineering, which is okay. a, yeah, it's a very, we very long-term. We can unpack term. that yeah, one. Yeah, we can unpack <laughs> that one. But basically the idea is um, we want to have an engineering methodology so that we can look at uh, what a system generally, but uh, typically more specifically for us, a ship, uh, what it does and then how we can construct it and trying to build different models to ensure that what we build actually does what, what, what we intend it to do. So you start with some sort of architecture design, you model that and you put it in operational environments, uh, yeah. in simulation environments? So, so the idea is it's a methodology for building two, two, two different types of models, building an, an operational model. Um, so oftentimes we'll look at uh, building a model for a ship, say, of doing uh, maritime introduction, so intercepting a drug boat, and then also right. doing search and rescue, so going right. out and finding something. And so building two different operational models, and then at the same time building a, a physics-based model. So if our operational model tells us, well, we, we have to go 25 knots, then we look at, from a physics perspective, well, what do we need to be able to have a ship that can go 25 knots? And that helps define, uh, define both the design of the ship, the power plant of the ship, uh, potentially, depending on the missions you looked at, even the crew size and that sort of thing. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, and so that's actually some of the interesting things that we'll see a lot of the time is that we have a ship that we say we'd, we'd like to be able to do these things and we'd like it to be this size and only have this many people on it and we'll find, well, those two things don't really make sense with respect to one another. So and essentially you're looking at the systems. Now one of the things I was going to ask you was to try to help us define what systems engineering is, but you're obviously a practitioner of that as you study different systems and how it's applied. Yes. But tell us, what is your definition of it? So, so yeah, so if you ask, uh, if you go over to the systems engineering department at MPS, you'll find people with background in, in physics, mechanical engineering, statistics like myself. Um, I mean, broadly, the first thing that they teach the uh, the cadets at the military academy at West Point, going to that right. army background there, is that, um, that a good solution to the wrong problem is it, it's still wrong. And so, um, yeah, it doesn't matter how great of an engineer you are, if you're not solving the correct problem, um, you're, you're, not, you're not adding value. And so a, a lot of systems engineering genuinely is saying this is the problem that we're looking 
looking to, to solve and, and characterizing that problem and making sure that we're directing our engineering effort, whether it's physics, statistics, mechanical engineering, what have you, towards the correct problem. So if I understand it, when we go back, let's, let's take a particular example. If you mm -hmm. have uh, a particular ship like a, an offshore patrol vessel that someone wants to design, sure. you would ask them, well, what are all the missions that you want that ship to perform? Correct. Uh, then you would uh, uh, build a simulation mm -hmm. for each of those missions, which then inform you the characteristics that that ship needs to have. Yeah. And then how do, how do you combine that information with, say, uh, ship architects who are actually going to build that ship? Yeah, so that's very much what we're, uh, one of the things that I'm looking at is building, a, we call them dashboards or, or dynamic decision support sort of environments mm -hmm. and, and looking at a way to say, well, if I have uh, constraints that I'm going to establish, so we'll have one of the interesting uh, projects that we did, you just alluded to, is uh, working on the offshore patrol vessel mm -hmm. was, a, was a ship. And so we built, we had students uh, build operational simulation models. So one student built a model of a notional ship, uh, just assuming that we had no physics-based constraints on it conducting anti-surface warfare. And he found, well, your ship must go this fast, it must be able to see targets out to, to this, this range, it must shoot this often. And then another student did the same thing looking at maritime interdiction, so intercepting drug boats. And another student did the same thing looking at search and rescue operations. And so we were able to say, well, operationally, you must have a ship that goes this fast, sees this far, shoots this far. Um, and then we built a physics-based model that says, well, um, if I am able to do that, uh, this is what my ship has to look like. So it must be this long. It must have a, a beam of this size. It must have this crew size. And so we build an environment where you, you impose constraints and you see, well, if my ship can only be so long, can it actually do the things in my operational simulation models that I say it needs to do? Uh, do you ever come across conflicting requirements within those models, and how's that solved? Certainly. Um, so that, that's a that's a tremendous, uh, tremendously <laughs> difficult problem, um, and so that's one of the things that, to to a certain extent, uh, that my research uh, is focused on doing. It's it's showing you what those trade offs are, and allowing you to go back and 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 you. Uh, one of the things that we emphasize is that systems engineering is always iterative. Is, right. is that you never start with a problem and say, all right, I'm going to go through and execute my, for, uh, we threw out capabilities focused model based systems engineering. It's, it, it, it sounds really fancy, but you don't just do it one time. And so you go through and you say, well, well, well now I need to perhaps relax one of my constraints. Um, one of the ones that we often find is it's very easy to say that my crew size can only be a certain size. Right. And, and you often find that um, that's just not going to work given the things that we want all of our ships to do. So we're either going to have to find some way to, to, to allow people to do more things, or we're going to have to find a way to get more people uh, on our ship. Now you have been funded, some of your research has been funded by the Office of Naval Research, and specifically uh, a program called Early Ship Design, and it sounds like that's what you're describing now. Yes, D did you respond, did you do anything else specifically for ONR, a specific ship uh, title or characteristic, or were you developing this process for them? So, so it was a little bit of both. Um, so we focused on, as you alluded to, this offshore patrol vessel, and we actually did that in conjunction with the Italian Navy. Um, it's actually just wrapping up. So Office of Naval Research had funded this, and it ended up growing into a program that we did uh, with NATO, one of their applied vehicle technology programs. And, um, and they're actually publishing their report this year, and it was focused on not only uh, th this offshore patrol vessel and deconflicting requirements there, but seeing if the methodology could be applied to another ship. And so uh, we did that primarily with the, the Italian Navy looking at this offshore patrol vessel, but then we also supported some research that the Dutch Navy did uh, looking at a, a minesweeper and trying oh. to look at the same sort of thing. Well, now, Paul, did this require you travel to Italy at any it sense? It certainly did. It's, it's, it's <laughs> awful. I had to go to Italy, had to go to the Netherlands, had to go to uh, just some terrible places. Well, those uh, those places are nice to you know establish long-term relationships uh, yes, and work uh, these, these research <laughs> problems with. Yeah. But now you've taken your research and you've also applied it to student projects on campus. Absolutely. Um, the offshore patrol vessel is one. But you recently uh, supported uh, expeditionary energy studies as well. Mm -hmm. How does this the same thing? Is it tied into the same way, or or is it a different topic? It, yeah, it's certainly. I mean, it's a different topic, but the fundamentals stay the same. And so that's that's one of the things that we try to emphasize to our students is that we're teaching you fundamentals that you can apply to a, a number of different problems. Mm -hmm. And so for the the. The, the project that you just discussed, we did with the, the Marine Corps Expeditionary Energy Office. And one of the things that uh, they emphasize is that they can't 
they can't consider doing an actual operation without considering their power requirements. So in right. terms of batteries, in terms of solar panels, in terms of fuel, they need to consider all of those things in conjunction with operationally what they'd like to accomplish. And, and from our perspective, that sounded very much the same as from a ship design fundamentals. Um, I, I know operationally what I want to accomplish, and I know physically this is what my ship has to look like. And we said, it looks like you guys are attempting to solve a similar problem, but now instead of I have constraints about the length or beam of my ship, it's about the number of batteries or the fuel that, that, that I have. And, and so uh, we approached it in much the same manner. And you did this for the, the uh, Marine Corps Energy Office yes. in order to help deform, uh, define those requirements. Well now, you also uh, just uh, advised a large group of students in systems engineering analysis mm -hmm. on uh, a fleet design project specifically directed by the CNO staff. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's part of, a, we have a systems engineering analysis curriculum mm -hmm. um, that there's a phenomenal chair for. Um, and uh, so the systems engineering analysis curriculum looks at uh, taking a large group of students and rather than having them do sort of individual theses, directed theses, they do a large group project. And so that group was uh, 19 students. We had uh, US Navy students, we had Israeli Army students, Singaporean Navy students, and they were all looking at um, if we're going to move forward with the, the U.S. Navy's fleet and we're going to move perhaps away from focusing on using our, our cruisers and destroyers to defend aircraft carriers, what, do, what does that actually mean for how we're going to employ them in the future? And so they looked at, they built a an operational simulation model again, uh, set in uh, set in about the 2030 time frame, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the employment of our of our ships to do to do different things, and so and so they came up with a fleet design similar in a way uh, to the same process that you came up with a ship design based Absolutely. on operational requirements. Yeah, so we knew operationally what we needed to do, but we, right. we, we ended up with a broader look. So rather than looking at doing something very, very uh, small or a limited engagement, you look at a much larger engagement, and your constraints are no longer length and beam of your ship, but it's quantities of certain types of, of certain Of capabilities and ships and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Well now, uh, it's, it must be quite a different experience to advise a large group of students that way and a yes. single ing individual thesis student. Def so tell, us, tell me some of the opportunities and challenges of advising a large project like that. Yeah, so um, there's certainly uh, challenges associated with it, particularly when you're looking at a, an international composition of people, because sure. um, you just have, you have cultural type distances or differences. Excuse me, but uh, but for the most part, I think it's an opportunity because, as I said, we get we have uh, students from every different service. So we had Air Force, we had we had Navy, we had Army. So we brought in uh, their, their experience base, and we said, well, how does the Marine Corps operate? And, and it's not just how does U.S. Marine Corps operate, but we can go out and, and look at how other countries and and. The the students are also from different curriculums, so, so we were able to get some students from electrical engineering, from computer science, from operations research, and so we were able to leverage their specific skills. So it's not just uh, an engineering student. Well, if I don't have the, the math background, perhaps one of my operations research students does, or, or if I, if I want to build a physical model, maybe I can go to one of my mechanical engineering students. And so um, it's certainly a challenge for the students. Uh, I think sure. it's very, very difficult for but them. But it's a truly interdisciplinary type experience, then, is absolutely. what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, and again, that's what, how systems engineering is in a good position in order to try to coordinate uh, much of that. Yeah. Now, does it help that all of the students are officers? Do they self-organize in a way, or they, do they you have to motivate? They self-organize. That 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 is uh, probably one of the most attractive things about being here. There is <laughs> there is no uh, need for me to motivate the students. They, okay. Uh, they will certainly self-organize to a very, very large degree. And uh, Now you're about ready to kick off, or you just kicked off this week, come this to think week, of it, yeah. a new interdisciplinary project. Tell us a little bit about that. So the project is looking at uh, undersea infrastructure defense, again in the 2030 time frame. Um, but this time we're challenging the students to, to look at uh, considerations for how we would defend undersea assets in, in different areas. So we're looking uh, to have them do it both in the Gulf of Mexico and then maybe off of Singapore. So you're talking about infrastructure structure, not just communication cables, but uh, all sorts of things, piping, anything see, that's under the yeah, water. Yeah, so anything that's down there, so you have the undersea communication cables are, are clearly a, a, a high value type thing, but, but piping and anything else that might be down there that we might be, be interested in, in utilizing or that somebody else might be interested in, in, in preventing us from utilizing. So the students are meeting this week, how do you kick them off? How do you start them thinking about the problem or what's the first thing you do to challenge them? 
So the first thing I do is tell them exactly what I told you, that a, a good solution to the wrong problem is wrong. And, and we're giving you, giving you the problem. We've given you the, the tools throughout your education here uh, to, to solve these problems intelligently. And, and now we're challenging you to, to utilize them. And so the first thing that I tell them is, is what you said, you guys have to organize. So this is another, another group of over 20 students from a half dozen different curriculums from multiple different countries. And so you guys have to actually sit down and, and really meet with each other and, and figure out what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, and, and how are you gonna how are you gonna work as a team? And so it's the first thing that I give them. I say you have to define your problem, and we're gonna work on that. But you have to you have to give me a schedule of how you're gonna deliver over the next year. You have to give me an organization. What are your what are your roles and responsibilities going to be? And so that is uh, that's your first step. Is that, that is that is step number one. That's what they got this morning. <laughs> that is your challenge, and that's due to me in two weeks. So we'll, well see, that's uh, great. Yeah. Uh, now these are actually uh, high visibility projects. I know that personally because uh, at times I'm get requested to actually provide the information after they're done. And these students, uh, uh, because of your good guidance, because of other advisors' good guidance, uh, they actually create products that are of interest to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases that's because they are free of the political and fiscal bonds and so they have certain numbers of freedoms that uh, the planners in the Pentagon don't. But they bring fresh ideas in many cases to the Pentagon, Absolutely. and those are always appreciated. Uh, with our last two minutes, uh, sure. what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about you personally and how much you enjoy living uh, in Monterey County. What do you enjoy doing? Yeah, so I, I love it here. As I said, I, I grew up, uh, father was in the Army, so I got to live all over the country, and, and this is far and away my favorite place. You lived at Army bases. Well, I, I did, I did, so perhaps not the, well, some unique challenges associated <laughs> with uh, where you're going to put an army base, but uh, but so mostly living in Monterey, I, I absolutely love it. I mean, it's 365 days a year I can do something outside, and it's something that that I love. And all the students, when I talk to them too, they find, hey, I can get outside 365. So, days what are a year some of your so, favorite activities? So, I love playing golf. Uh, oh, do you? Sure. Great. Do. What yeah. are your, some of your courses? Uh, so, I play over at Bayonet and Black Horse. Sure, uh, Bayonet's cool the only there. place that'll let me go on, actually. So, no. the, the, only, the only one, no, nowhere else. Yeah. So, so I love playing over there. Uh, it's yeah. Certainly very. That nice is a beautiful courses. scene. It's a beautiful course. It's absolutely wonderful. So you can see the ocean and everything from it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dr. Paul Berry, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank and you thank you for much. being an MPS faculty member. You're a national asset, and I'm glad that we can tap you for these projects and help inform the future of our Navy and Department of Defense. And thank you for uh, joining us uh, for this segment of the Naval Postgraduate Scout Foundation sponsored uh, Your Town Television Program. My name is Jeff Klein and I hope you join us again soon to learn more about interesting things that our faculty and students are doing here in the Monterey County region.